close the back door just for acoustics. Do you want to close that door? Let people in? Great. All right, so we're going to get started. Thank you all for coming out on this dreary, gray, raining Friday afternoon in Washington, D.C. Um, I think you are in for a treat. Your time will be very well spent. I say that having read the book that is a subject, or at least the hook for today's discussion, Preventing Palestine, by my friend Seth Enziska, who is sitting to my left. Um, my name is Laura Friedman. I am the president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. We are very happy to host this event in cooperation with our partner, the Middle East Institute. Um, today, we are going to have Seth here to talk about his book, which examines um, the fate of Middle East peacemaking, starting with really the hook of Camp David and the U.S. Uh, the Israel-Egypt peace accords through Oslo. Um, after Seth speaks for a little bit, we're going to have comments from Jim Zogby, who needs no introduction, I think, but I will introduce him as the founder and head of the Arab American Institute and someone who has worked on these issues in Washington for basically the entire period covered in Seth's book. Um, so I, I look forward to, to his insider commentary and reflections on that. Um, after Jim speaks, I will give a few reflections of my own um, from the perspective of an analyst and also someone who worked inside the State Department during the Oslo period. We'll have a brief discussion amongst the three of us and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience, which I will warn you now will have to be questions or I will cut you off. Um, so, and I, I am known for being tough on long questions or long comments that, that masquerade as questions. So with that, I'm gonna hand this off to Seth. Um, I don't know if he's gonna do a little reading from the book or just go into comments. Seth, why don't you talk for maybe 10, 15 minutes and then we can move on. Perfect. Can you hear me? Is it on? Okay. Well, thank you so much uh, to Laura and to the FMEP and the MEI for hosting us and Jim for being here as well. It's such an honor to be with both of you whom I admire and respect so much and who have inspired many of the questions that I asked uh, that led to this book. And what I want to do is just talk briefly about how I came to write the book, what are sort of the central themes that I'm dealing with in the book, and, and then I want really to engage with all of you about uh, what I, th I, I found and, and how it might have some bearing on what's happening uh, today. Um, this book is the product of over 10 years of research um, and writing that took me uh, first to archives here in the United States, the Jimmy Carter Library, uh, the Reagan Library, but also I'll talk about in a moment to the Israel State Archives in Jerusalem, to the Institute for Palestine Studies in Beirut. Um, and I wanted to understand <laughs> how and why Palestinian statelessness persists. Um, 40 years since the Camp David Accords, which we just marked on Monday, and 25 years since the Oslo Accords, which we marked last Friday. And we tend to think of these two events, iconic events in the history of US Middle East peacemaking, uh, as uh, ways or, or moments in time that were intended to bring about the possibility of a Palestinian state. And yet what we find all of these years later is quite the opposite. We, we, we have a situation of persistent lack of statehood and the lack of sovereignty for Palestinians living in the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and in the Arab diaspora. And the question that guided this book is how can it be that at the very moment when Palestinian demands for self-determination are first being taken seriously here in the United States in the mid-1970s, that the outcome uh, of the Camp David Accords seems to disenfranchise Palestinians. And this particular moment that I start looking at in the early stages of the book is really the product of the mid-1970s. Many of you may have known about or participated in the Brookings Institution uh, investigation into the question of Palestinian sovereignty uh, that took place in the mid-1970s. This became the blueprint for Jimmy Carter's approach to dealing with the Palestinians. And he is the first US president to talk openly of a homeland for Palestinians. He makes that remark in 1977 in a press conference in Clinton, Massachusetts, which raises hackles uh, from Cold War conservatives and American Jewish uh, political leaders. Um, he's also the first US president to think openly about the idea of a comprehensive peace to address the results of 
1967 and 1973 war. So unlike Henry Kissinger and his shuttle diplomacy, which was focused more narrowly on bilateral agreements between Israel and Syria, Israel um, and Jordan, Israel and Egypt, Carter comes in with a much more expansive idea. And to the credit of his Middle East team, in particular Zbigniew Brzezinski and Cyrus Vance, as well as several prominent members of the National Security Council, he draws up the blueprints of a much more comprehensive approach to thinking and dealing with the region with the Palestinian question at the core. Why does that view of Middle East peace lead instead to a much more limited outcome of peace between Egypt and Israel? And so the first part of the book tells the story of how and why this happened. And it looks at newly released sources that first became available to me here in the United States. But to my great surprise, uh, when I went to Jerusalem into the Israel State Archives, I was lucky to be there at a moment in time when those archives were open to researchers after 30 years uh, of declassification, which is the Israeli law regarding the release of documents. And what those materials showed, aside from the specific mechanics of the Camp David negotiations themselves, which tends to be the focus of much of the scholarship on this uh, episode, were the minutes of all of the meetings of what became known as the autonomy talks, or the negotiations over Palestinian self-rule in the West Bank and Gaza that were implemented from 1979 until the eve of the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982. And those were a series of meetings that took place between the Egyptians, the Israelis, and the Americans, where Palestinian sovereignty was first seriously being talked about and negotiated for the first time. And yet, what I found in reading that material is that the imprint of the political worldview of Menachem Begin, who had been elected the Israeli Prime Minister from the Likud party in 1977, shaped that notion of autonomy to focus on potential rights of individual residents in the West Bank and Gaza Strip and East Jerusalem, but not collective sovereignty for Palestinians as a whole. And we'll see how echoes of that idea have actually resurfaced today when we look at what's happening on the ground now. Uh, so the first half of the book looks at the political and diplomatic process of state prevention, of how the Israelis, but also, as I argue, the Egyptians, the Americans, uh, not necessarily uh, intentionally, uh, end up facilitating the triumph of this model of autonomy rather than sovereign self-rule and sovereign statehood. Now, the book then pivots from the end of the 1970s to look at the transformation with the rise of Ronald Reagan and what I call the neoconservative turn in American foreign policy. And it's really the election of Reagan, the appointment of many uh, Middle East advisors who have a very different way of thinking about Israel, about the Palestinians, and about the broader region, a reinscription of the Cold War context, a vision of the PLO as a Soviet proxy, a uh, desire to uh, cultivate a strategic relationship in formal terms for the first time with Israel in the early 1980s that brings about a transformation in American policy towards these questions. It also leads to very interesting and unnoticed legal shifts. The, the Reagan administration moves away from Carter's attitude that the settlements are illegal and starts looking at them as obstacles to peace rather than illegal. What does this mean in actual point of fact? Well, it helps to enable massive settlement expansion in the 1980s under uh, Begin and Ariel Sharon, first as a Minister of Agriculture and then as the Minister of Defense. Also, the other thing that comes out of this shift is explicit US support for Israel's intervention in Lebanon. And now, thanks to the meticulous minutes of Charles Hill, who was the uh, staff aide to Alexander Haig, the Secretary of State, whose notebooks uh, are uh, deposited at the Hoover Institute at Stanford, we can uh, see very, very clearly that when Sharon comes here to Washington in May of 1982, he very clearly, uh, with American uh, foreknowledge, talks about what he intends to do uh, in Lebanon. As Haig says, you mean a lobotomy, uh, an excising of the political rule in Lebanon and the replacement of that with a client state sympathetic to uh, Israeli interests. That green light, as Hill describes it, is what empowers the Israelis to intervene uh, militarily in June of 1982, leading to unforeseen and disastrous consequences uh, for the Lebanese, for the Palestinians, 
but also for U.S. standing in the Middle East. I see 1982 as a formative moment in Middle Eastern politics and history, uh, and one that has great bearing on what we see happening uh, today. So the second half of the book looks at the shift from the political and diplomatic efforts at state prevention to the military intervention in Lebanon. How does that war serve to uh, allow the Israelis to pursue this goal of prevention of Palestinian sovereignty in military terms? Uh, and that is the, the second half uh, of the story. I can talk a little bit, perhaps, in the Q&A or the discussion about how uh, new revelations, in particular around the Sabra and Shatila massacre uh, that I've now written about uh, and whose original documentation I can say more about, uh, has been published this week, how that uh, explains many of the broader dynamics that I'm talking about throughout this book, how the, the thinking and the discussion and the attitude and approach to the wards of the Palestinians um, and, and towards Palestinian civilians and refugees in particular animates this violent uh, and result. Um, what happens when we get to the late 80s and into the 1990s? Well, the story and the book ends uh, with the Oslo Accords, which in many ways subverts the early attempts through the Madrid talks and Washington talks in the 1991, 1992, um, a, a moment that actually were potentially leading to the possibility of sovereign outcomes for the Palestinians. And what I argue is that the, the success uh, of Oslo and Yasser Arafat's desire to return to the West Bank and to Gaza actually upends a lot of the progress that had been made in that Madrid uh, 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 track. And that imprint of autonomy of Begin's attitude towards the Palestinians only as individuals rather than a collective, rather than seeing them as a people, is at the core of what animates the outcome of Oslo itself. And we can see this with the establishment of a Palestinian authority. The idea of limited self-rule takes root uh, in the West Bank and in Gaza without the possibility of a sovereign outcome. We can talk about whether that was intentional or whether that wasn't, whether Rabin himself had the idea of a state uh, at the end uh, of the equation. Um, where does this leave us uh, today in this post-Oslo era? What I wanted to do in the book is to interrogate this obsession that we tend to have with only looking at the history of this story from the 1990s to the present. This is, in my view, a very big mistake. Ignoring this wider history, ignoring this 15-year uh, 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 sort of decade and a half prior to Oslo, obscures the historical roots and origins of many of the phenomena that we're now dealing with today. And we can see this if we pay very close attention to the rise of rhetoric about the return of ideas around limited autonomy. If you listen to Naftali Bennett, Israel's education minister, a very prominent leader of, uh, of the Israeli right, he talks about the need for autonomy on steroids. Those are his words. Uh, other Israeli officials are talking about the revival of Begin's ideas of autonomy. And even Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is talking about the idea of a state minus. Lest you think this is limited to the right, there are also politicians in the center and on the left who also talk about ideas of separation and no longer talk about the possibility of Palestinians attaining sovereign statehood. So this is where the story brings us uh, in the conclusion. Um, I want us to rethink the periodization, the way we imagine and understand the roots of where we got today, um, but also to consider all the new evidence that's now been released in Israel uh, from Palestinian uh, uh, sources in Lebanon and here in the United States as well as in Europe. Uh, and the last thing that I'll say is it's important also not to think of this story as a monocausal story, as America alone or Israel alone responsible uh, for Palestinian state prevention. This is a complex, contingent history. It has to do with Egyptian agency in the story. It has to do with the PLO itself. It's um, uh, sort of slow adoption of international resolutions like UN Resolution 242, but also the domestic factors, the Cold War conservatives, the American Jewish community, and some of the domestic uh, sources of tension that are happening here in the United States in the 1970s and 1980s. This, for historians, which is where I'm coming from, is a very rich and fruitful field of inquiry. There's a lot of new, exciting work that's happening on the 1970s and 1980s. But for me, and, and very much being here in, in Washington to talk about this, is to consider the ways in which this historical perspective can shape the way we might think about what is happening now on the ground 
in Israel and Palestine, but also the developments here in Washington towards the fate of the Palestinian question. So I'll leave it at that, and I look forward, Jim and Laura, to your comments. Thank you, Seth. Uh, thank you, Laura, for, for inviting me to do this. That's the mic. Okay, I, I said thank you, Seth, and thank you, Laura, for inviting me to do this. Um, the book is just out, so you haven't read it, but you really should, uh, especially for those of you who are my age and, and, and older who lived through this, um, and, and an incredibly important study of, of the period. Um, I, I have to say that it was painful to read the book. Um, having been a close observer and sometime participant in the events, um, it uh, sort of opened up old wounds and also uh, shed some light on uh, situations that had developed that provided a backstory, provided a backstory for me. Um, I, um, I was thinking that when I first read it, I said to my wife, it reminds me of when I was in eighth grade, uh, we all were taken to see the robe, uh, one of those spectaculars about the, the death of Christ and the East, it was an Easter time story. Uh, and at the very point in the movie where the Roman soldiers are nailing Jesus to the cross, a girl about eight rows in front says, stands up and says, you can't do that to him. Um, well, they did. Uh, we know the story. Um, we know how it ends. Um, and that's how I felt reading it. It was with almost every page, it was, it didn't have to be this way. It could have been different if only we had, uh, but we didn't, and so we know how the story ends. Um, and I agree with Seth that to know where we are is to understand how we got here, um, and, um, uh, and to know that it really has not been an accident that we end up where we are. Um, and the mistakes that were made, uh, we continue to make, which is why the whole simply gets deeper. I, um, it does trace the, the period. I mean, the very first time I testified before Congress was the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. It was on 1975. It, I was presenting testimony against the Kissinger, uh, the Sinai Disengagement Plan, and something that no one in the states knew about because it hadn't been public. Uh, but actually Rob Malley's dad, who was editing a magazine in Paris, had written a piece about it, about the secret agreement to, um, uh, to not have dialogue with the PLO, uh, was something I testified. I said, the, you are digging a hole here. We will be living with the consequences of this, uh, this no-talk policy for, for a generation. Um, they either played ignorant or simply brushed it aside. It wasn't an issue they wanted to, uh, to deal with. I, I lived through that decade and a half of the no-talk policy, actually almost two decades of the no-talk policy. And uh, when, you know, when what, what was so interesting to me though, that it's not actually not in the book, it was when I saw a couple of quotes, one from Shamir and one from Rabin, that said that no talk with the PLO, no recognition of the PLO, not because, Shamir said quite plainly, not because of terrorism, but because recognizing them or talking to them acknowledges their right to self-determination, this we can never live with. So that issue of denying peoplehood of Palestinians from the beginning um, was, was what, you know, what, what I think led to the no talk policy, but also led to much of the autonomy plan and, and uh, and the, the manipulation of peace processes over the, the, the last several decades, and also is where we are today, which is what your, I, I think your conclusion to this is absolutely right. Um, that we, we are in a position where, in effect, Begin's plan is being implemented by default. Um, not necessarily by intention, but by default. Um, uh, parts of the book that were just so fascinating to me were the backstory. It was the, for example, the the conversations between Sharon and um, and Maury Draper. You enlarge on that. I, actually, the the documentation is there in the link to the New York Review of Books 
piece I, you really ought to look at it. It was quite, you lived through it for God's sake, you know it. Um, but I used to deal all the time with Maury Draper and April Glaspie at the State Department when they were both uh, Deputy Assistant Secretaries. Um, really good people, um, very caring and smart people. I remember April got blasted over the Saddam uh, giving the green light. And here I'm reading Maury Draper, in effect, giving the green light to Ariel Sharon. But that wasn't the talking point they went into. And I could almost imagine April not having that talking point going into the Sharon conversation. But they were bullied. Uh, Saddam, we know, was a bully. Ariel Sharon was a bully. And reading the exchange, Draper saying this and Sharon immediately cutting him off with, how dare you, da, da, da. And, and Maury coming back with, well, that's not exactly what I meant. And then as the conversation got shifted downward, it essentially was, uh, okay, uh, you know, I, I, I can't, just don't make it look bad. Uh, that's kind of where we ended up with the, with, with the discussion. The little bits you have about Bashir Jamal that I know you'll probably enlarge on when you get to the, 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 the next book, also quite, Fascinating, but also really disturbing. Um, uh, this was a person who fought genocide from the beginning um, and made his intent clear uh, to the Israelis, um, who kind of laughed it off. When he talks about eliminating, he means killing, they said. Um, and, um, and of course, we know that they did. Um, the, um, the Begin Bashir, exchange were also interesting. I mean, in the sense that Begin comes in with telling the Americans that he's the savior of the Christians of Lebanon. Um, I know as a Jew what happened to us and what's happening to them and the PLO is Hitler and it's doing to them and we're going to save them. Uh, and after all of this magnanimous rhetoric about saving the Christians because that's his mission, um, when Bashir refuses to sign the peace deal, then he t turns on a dime, um, and they become the, the enemy um, that he uh, has no patience for um, at, at all. I, just let me, I mean, there's so many stories in the book that need to be told, but I, you really ought to read it. Whether you live through it or not, you should know this history. But I just want to conclude with the, 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 the couple of quotes, one from Begin, another one from um, Ben Elazar, I think, about that in this envisioned autonomy, uh, the Israelis pledging magnanimity that equal rights, equality, uh, why can't we live a, as equals in this land? Um, and I would envision Palestinians today saying, great idea, bud and throwing Begin's words right back at him and say, this is the hole you dug, we're in it together, now let's all have equal rights, because that's kind of where the situation is right now. Um, uh, they prevented Palestine, uh, both in, by the words and the, the negotiation strategy, but also by the settlement building and the adoption of the Drobel's plan in the 70s that physically makes the West Bank difficult to, to separate from, from Israel. That's where you are. So if, if you want to do equal rights, then, then, then let's go for it. That's kind of where I end up in my, my looking at the book. Thank you again, Seth, for doing it. So I'm just going to add some thoughts of my own, and I will echo what Jim said. This is, this is something that I would urge people to read. Sorry. We're going to open it to Q&A. Can I? No, I'm going to make some comments, and we're going to have a discussion, and then we'll open it to Q&A, so just very quickly. Um, I just want to make a few points. First of all, read the book. Um, I, I am not, um, I'm not going to pretend that this was fun reading. It was um, extremely depressing reading, and I marked it up heavily, as you can see, if you were to look at my copy of it. Um, I, I want to make a couple of points in terms of the, the timeliness, because I think a lot of us in Washington, you know, that you can, don't let, you know. You know, we're all busy with the urgent. You know, this is important, but what about the urgent? What's happening right now? And it, it's worth, you know, the, the old thing about those who do not learn from history are, are going to repeat it. Um, and, and reading this book not only reminds you that that has happened over and over, um, but it reminds you that that's where we are now. Um, and you know, if, if we want to argue that the future is not already predetermined and, and inevitable, then learning from the past is, 
is an important piece of that. Some of the sort of overarching lessons that I pulled from this, or not lessons, um, I would say points that I think are worth repeating that maybe a lot of us know who've worked in foreign policy or who are analysts. There, there are mistakes that have been made over and over from the US side in working on Israel-Palestinian peacemaking. Sometimes it's mistakes because we're naive or we are overly optimistic or because maybe we have an ideological affinity for one side over the other or because maybe we bring some kind of quasi-colonial preferences where we actually prefer, we view one side as somehow genuinely more legitimate, having more legitimate interests. But what comes through this book over and over is the US discounting or, or soft peddling in its own analysis the very, very clearly articulated positions of the Israeli government. And they are articulated mm. over and over and mm -hmm. over. And they're articulated in, it, it, with such clarity, often in the same words, year after year. When Natalie Bennett is now talking about state minus, they were using, it'll be something, not a Palestinian state, it'll be sovereignty minus. That was the language in the 70s. And yet, we had this sort of um, victory of hope over actual information analysis, which led us to say, yes, but we'll get a process going. This will sound familiar to everyone who is involved in Oslo. We'll get a process going, and then the momentum of that process will lead people to change and lead to more opportunities, which is not an unreasonable thing to hope for, but to make policy on this one year after year after year, in cycle after cycle, we've actually seen that the Israelis are playing a very long game. And the positions that were described at the beginning of the era of peacemaking, at the beginning before Camp David by Begin, his positions vis-a-vis -vis the West Bank are what we're seeing as the positioning today. One should take that seriously. And if the answer is that we are not going to clash with Israel, then we need to say that. And to some extent, maybe give the Trump administration credit because they are doing that for the first time in a much more open way. We have also consistently discounted in our policy the importance of what's actually happening on the ground. And I say this as someone who served at the US consulate during Oslo as the settlements officer, where reporting on what was happening on settlements, settlements was necessary and we did it, but it wasn't particularly welcome um, in Washington. We were very careful. I learned very early on in my tour not to put any of my own analysis in my own words. If I wanted to put something in a cable analyzing the impact of what was happening, I would have to put it in the mouth of someone else. Like, the British political officer has surmised that. <laughs> if you FOIA my cables, which I have from that era, it's amazing how many times I found someone else to articulate what I thought was going on so I could quote them because I wasn't going to put it on my own words because it wasn't welcome. The information was, was believed, it was not only unwelcome, but, I mean, I had one senior official tell me once, it's not necessary. We don't really need to be reporting on settlements anymore. We have a peace process, and it's going to take care of all this. So it's not really that important that we keep reporting. But you go ahead and do it, junior officer. And, and we did. We have the issue also, from the beginning, of marginalizing the importance of genuine Palestinian leadership. And this is something that we need to look at today. If the history of the peace process before Oslo was how do we prevent the Palestinians from having any cross-cutting leadership, not just individuals speaking for themselves or village leaders speaking <coughs> for a village, but a national people's leadership. How do we keep them out of it? Because that's what the whole process was designed to do. We then have an era of peacemaking which is designed to neutralize that leadership. You are now locked into a process that will not only deliver you nothing, but will keep you from pursuing anything else. And then today, we're now back 25 years later at a point where the US administration is leading a policy to once again marginalize and delegitimize Palestinian leadership. And here I will report, repeat a point I've been making for the past year. The US has now passed legislation called the Taylor Force Act, which everyone seems to believe is about cutting aid to the Palestinians. It is not. The purpose of this legislation is to have as a matter of US law that the PLO and the PA support terror. And that is going to be built upon in the future. Mark my words. All of this takes us back to where we are again at this moment, which is what I'm the most interested in. Let's learn from history. 
And one of the arguments I've been making for the past year when people say, well, what is the Trump plan? What is, and I, I keep saying, I, I, we don't have a piece of paper. We don't need a piece of paper. They're implementing their plan. And you want, if you want to see what the outcome of the Trump plan looks like as it is being implemented, don't try to read tea leaves. Look at the situation before Madrid because that's what we're rolling it back to. Not just pre-Oslo when there was at least the, the, the notion of working for a peace agreement. We're going back to pre-Madrid where we're talking and let's think about the discourse around refugees right now in UNRWA which is the discourse on how do we help these poor people and their humanitarian needs, and how do we separate it from anything related to the political. That's essentially the argument being used when people say we should get money to the Palestinian refugees, but let's not call them refugees and let's get rid of, let's get rid of UNRWA. We're also returning to something that Seth talks about a great deal in the book. You mentioned the role of Egypt, the role of Jordan. U.S. policy, and very much Israeli policy, pre-Camp David was all predicated on how can we find someone else to be the agent who will, who will negotiate on the Palestinians' behalf and make irrevocable concessions on the Palestinians' behalf, and then we can call this done. And we are very much in that era again, whether we're talking about Jordan or Egypt or most notably Saudi Arabia. So this book is not just a history book. I read it and I kept thinking, this is a roadmap which takes us not just how we got to where we are today, but gives a very, very good indication of where we're heading if, if people don't decide to head it off, to, to try to somehow go a different course or push for a different course. And I don't know how one does that. I'm not suggesting any particular specific changes. But I will, on my last point again, get back to settlements. Facts on the ground matter. These continue to matter. And we're once again in an era where, you know, it's as if people want to believe that facts on the ground, well, we'll deal with them later. Let's get a political process started again. And let's find a process that will allow someone, maybe it's the Saudis this time, to resolve this on behalf of the Palestinians. It hasn't worked in the past. It didn't work before Oslo. It didn't work in the pre-Madrid period. I, I think it's clear it won't work now. But where it takes us, and this is what I'll stop on, if you look at what the situation was, the security situation, before Madrid, before Oslo, I would urge people to think very, very deeply about what that means today and where that leads us today when the political horizon is erased completely, the hope for restoring a political horizon is completely negated, and we return the Palestinian people to a position where they are fighting really to establish the fact that they exist at all, let alone that they have a right to a political horizon and self-determination. So I will end there. Um, I don't know, Jim, if you want to ask Seth some questions, or Seth, if you want to follow up, or if we just want to open it up to the audience. At this point. Maybe we should take some questions. Okay, yeah. so we're going to open up. We're going to start with Nick. Um, I'm going to let people have a little bit of room, uh, particularly I think there's a lot of people in this room who have participated in the peace efforts along the way. So I'm going to give a little more leeway to those people to have commentary and not just ask questions. Um, a microphone will come around. So we're going to start with Nick Veliotis in the front, and then we'll come over. So be ready with your questions. Hi. Uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to reading the book. Uh, I was Deputy Assistant Secretary during Carter and Assistant Secretary during the first three years of the Reagan administration. And. Uh, involved in Jordan, so I look forward to this. Uh, and and your, your, but I, your reflections are present uh, in the book as well. I was well. assistant secretary from January 81 till the end of 83. And I was deputy assistant secretary from 77 to 79, then ambassador to Jordan from 79 to 80. Uh, first, let me say, you mentioned Jimmy Carter's proclamation of a homeland. I won't go into the whole background on this, but it was a mistake, you know, because he never asked, what can I get for it? What we were asking for, or would have asked for, was that the PLO accept 242 and 338. And who knows? 
for the American president going on record. For a homeland, that might have been possible. But we were never asked. Jimmy Carter just decided he was going to do it. And we were asked to find reasons to support his statement consistent with the United Nations resolutions over the years. Of course, there were none on that. But what I, I do want to challenge is your interpretation of the, the Draper conversation. Our policy, and the Israelis knew our policy, was to get them out of Beirut. This was nothing that we relied on one conversation with the Israelis. And Maury was carrying out our policy. But if you've ever been in a room with Arik Sharon, he shouts. And Maury was not a shouter. <laughs> Phil Habib was a shouter. I was a shouter. <laughs> I, I remember. But Maury, <laughs> but Maury wasn't. So I think it's unfair to his memory to say that he somehow prolonged the massacre in Sabra and Shatila. That's not fair. Maury worked for years trying to save lives out in the Middle East. And this shouldn't be the last word on Maury Draper's contribution. Mm. Having said this, I look forward to reading your book. I appreciated your comments. Thank you. And even yours, Jim. Let me, let me just actually answer this. Th thank you, Ambassador Eliotis, because we, we had a chance, you may not recall, but several years ago we had a chance to talk about this. Several, several years ago we had a chance to talk about this period in an interview. So you do have uh, some material and some quotations from our discussion and from your interviews with the Foreign Service that are actually included in the book. And I have great admiration and, and respect for all of what you were contributing and what we've talked about in particular in the Carter and Reagan period. But what I do want to say in relationship to Draper in particular and my interpretation uh, of the documents, this is a, a, a complicated uh, challenge for historians. How do we take primary source material of minutes of diplomatic meetings and make historical sense of them from an analytical perspective and from the perspective trying to explain and understand what happened? We were not in the room. I was not born in 1982. I was born in 1983. So this is very hard for me to imagine. What I do try to do is recreate and understand the events as I have read from the material that was given to me and also through interviews with people like you and others, uh, including Sam Lewis, to try and get some perspective on what was happening at the time. And I'm very careful in the book, as also I am careful in the articles that I have written about it, not to ascribe intentionality to the actions of Draper or the actions of the Americans. Rather, what I'm trying to do is describe the process by which the political violence unfolds. And I think this distinction is very important. And the reason I make this distinction is because the manuscript had to be vetted by a lawyer, in particular because of concerns about libel and defamation. That would be for somebody like Draper, who's no longer alive, but also for Israeli and Lebanese officials who are very much alive and will be very unhappy with some of the things that have been discovered in these documents. And I can say how and why I got some of this material. And in vetting this chapter and in vetting the manuscript through Princeton University Press with lawyers, many of the responses that came back to me asked similar questions about intentionality. And as I explained to the lawyers, and I'll reiterate now, if you read closely in the book and you read closely in the text that I've written about it, I have explained the results of what happens because of these conversations and because of this onslaught of Sharon's rhetoric and his demands and his insistence on his particular position. I'm interested in the outcome. I'm not interested in ascribing, in this case, guilt to Draper or an individual U.S. diplomat. I'm interested in understanding the processes by which those diplomats are brought into conversations where they are driven in certain ways unwittingly, which is the language that I use in, in, in writing about it, into a position where that massacre is prolonged. Mm -hmm. And if we look very carefully at the dynamics over those three days between September 16th and September 18th, 
1982. That September 17th meeting was taking place while that massacre was unfolding, while it was already known to members of the Israeli cabinet and others that the Falange were in the camps and that things were happening in the camps, and yet at that time Sharon is insisting that this is only a story of terrorists. And this is the danger of this kind of rhetoric and the dehumanizing of Palestinians, which is in many ways forced upon the American diplomats. The trouble is that if we read the documents closely, we also see how Draper gets caught up in this onslaught by no fault of his own and not because of a malicious intent on his part. And I'm very clear about that. But I'm interested in explaining and describing what in effect that actually produces as an outcome. But the massacre was ongoing when Maury was meeting. Yes. And Mo uh, well, how do you, and it ended early the next day. Yes, but. So where do you come, what, the judgment that it prolonged the be Because the American intention. We never accepted Sharon's claim of 30,000 yes. terrorists or any terrorists. And yet, and yet, there was no removal or forced pullback of the Israeli troops from West Beirut. And the ways in which the Lebanese army could have been brought in as a replacement. And that was precisely the basis of which Draper was going in to talk to Sharon about, was the need to remove your troops, to get out of uh, South Beirut, and to stop allowing the Falange to continue what they were doing. Sharon insists these are only terrorists, and that is why we are there. And I will wait until after Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, which is the day on which that meeting is happening, uh, for us to make uh, uh, further plans. And that, that is, uh, and, and we look at the work of Bayan Nuwehid Ahud, who's the world's expert on that massacre, as a result of that prolonged delay, more people are killed in the context of Sabra and Shatila itself. I don't want to belabor this other people have questions, but you're wrong. <laughs> that, I know I, I, on more I, not on what the Israelis may have been. I, I think if you read the section, you will. I, if well, you, maybe it's unfortunate that the article that I read focused on this, or it was put in the. Yeah, I don't think he's unfair to Draper. I don't think he's unfair at all. I don't think he, he has a scribe's intention. Okay. He se he sees the situation playing out as. I don't think April Glaspie is responsible for the invasion of Kuwait, but in Saddam's mind, this is what he heard. And what came out of it was that behavior. In Ariel Sharon's mind, I, 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 I will ascribe intentionality if you don't mind. Um, um, I would bet he left the room and said, that son of a bitch is gonna do nothing because I've just bullied him. Well, that, that's and, that, and so the result is, is that whatever our intention was <laughs> to stop it and pull back, that's not what Sharon ended up reading from that transcript, and that's not what no, anyone right. would read from it. No, he went in so that when, in, before the war begins, when the U.S. says to the Israelis, have a provocation before you do anything, and they take some event that happened in London that had nothing to do with the PLO, uh, yes, we said nothing about yeah. it afterwards. And the result is, is that they felt totally justified and, in doing and it. And we need to ask a broader question about the Reagan administration's agency in this war itself. Yeah. And, and that, that is a, a bigger question, and that has to do with the origins of the war, it has to do with the ways in which it's prolonged, with the marine deployment, but I think it's high time we more closely investigate the legacy of the Reagan administration in the Middle East in, in, in general, and in Lebanon in particular, and that's the aim of this chapter. I, I will make a comment that it sounds to me like the two of you need to write an article together. Yeah. I'm just saying. With pleasure. That, I, that would be, I think that would be a very interesting discussion to actually see fleshed out as deeper yeah. analysis, and I think it would benefit the historical record enormously. So yeah. I'm going to encourage that now that you've met. We're going to go to Paul Sham here. Thanks very much. I'm actually in the process of reading the book, but I'm reading it so carefully. I'm not very far along. I wanted to ask about something that Laura particularly focused on, 
and see how, if you see it the same way, that today we certainly see resonances of the big and autonomy ideas. However, in between, we had some Israeli leaders who transcended that, who came from a different background. Uh, in uh, about 95, I heard Rob speak a few blocks from here saying, uh, this is not a blueprint for a Palestinian state. And I remember wondering, is he fooling us or fooling himself? Mm. Because we know where he went and others went beyond that, Yossi Bell. And so it seems to me that despite what you correctly found about setting a stage and an atmosphere of autonomy and limiting Palestinian collective rights. There was a period in the 90s when <coughs> that could have changed. And now the Israeli leadership and American and Palestinian is clearly not conducive to that. So why, yeah. how do you see well, that? Well, I, I think you're pointing to a broader uh, methodological mm -hmm. challenge, which is how do we write about a non-event or the prevention of something, the prevention of statehood? And this is a question of causality. It's a question of how to write history, of not being path dependent or anachronistic. When I talk about statehood now, this is not at all what Carter envisions in the late 70s. Homeland is not equal state. So we have to think also the ways in which these terms shift over time. And I don't want to say that the possibility of Palestinian sovereignty was foreclosed inevitably as a result of what happened. I say in the book, and I'll reiterate it now, there were possibilities that could have opened up and that may very well still exist in terms of the fate of uh, Palestinian self-determination. I will, however, make a comment in particular about Yitzhak Rabin and his vision of what he imagined uh, in relationship to the Oslo Accords. And it's a, a perhaps an appropriate time to think about this now that we're on the 25th anniversary. There is a tendency to reify Rabin and put him up on a pedestal for the ways in which he engaged on the Palestinian issue. And while we should not discount the enormous importance of mutual recognition between Israel and the PLO that happens in 1993, we should also not believe that Rabin believed in Palestinian statehood. He was very clear, as you said, that this was not necessarily at all the outcome that he wanted or that he sought. It may be the case that some of his advisors believed that statehood was the inevitable outcome, but this was not on the table. And one does not have to look farther than our dear friend Naftali Bennett, who posts on his Facebook account videos of Rabin in his last speech in the Knesset talking about a sub-sovereign, non-statist outcome for the Palestinians. There is a celebration on the right when videos like that surface. Because look, even Rabin didn't believe in Palestinian statehood. So we also have to go back and ask whether that was particularly uh, the case. Um, at the same time, I could talk about windows uh, or possibilities that opened in Madrid uh, and in the Washington talks here in 1991, 1992, that very seriously were dealing with the possibility of Palestinian sovereignty and territory um, in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. So it's not a story of path-dependent, inevitable prevention. It is about something more contingent and complex. If, if I could just add, in some ways, and not to assign further reading, but so, you know, this book is one piece of the puzzle. I, you know, I, I appreciate your comments very much, Paul, and I, I appreciate the, you know, it, it, it's part of what gives us hope that things can change, that there is a constituency. But, you know, I'm also doggedly interested in facts on the ground. I was a settlements officer in Jerusalem. That's where I cut my teeth on this issue professionally. I was in Jerusalem from 92 to 94. So I was there for the birth of the, the, the Oslo process and the burst of settlement activity that accompanied it following a very short and not serious freeze. 
I was there when Rabin refused to remove the settlers from Hebron following the Hebron massacre. And I was there to watch from us moving to the pre-Oslo point when there were so many settlements that people were already saying it's hard to imagine any, any, to, any outcome where there's real autonomy, to Oslo ushering an era of unprecedented settlement growth in East Jerusalem and across the West Bank. Um, the, I understand the, 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 the importance to not let um, us lose hope, but you know the, the goal of keeping hope on the horizon, if it requires us to, to set aside the facts, you know, I, I wrote something a year ago almost um, about the death of the peace process. And I reflected on a story, which somebody, somebody, someday someone will FOIA the, the, the cable from a meeting that we had with settlers, I think it was in 19, early 94 maybe. We were meeting in, in a settlement with a guy named Pinhas Wallerstein, who at that time was the head of the regional council mm. for that part of the West Bank, and he, or the, the settlers council. He is now a top official um, working on changing the contours of West Bank land so they can build more settlements. Mm -hmm. At that time, at the, this is the peak of hope around Oslo. I went there and he pulled out these map after map, diagram after diagram of all of the bypass roads that they were gonna build, the massive infrastructure that would make it impossible for any government to ever seed land, ever divide the land, and that would, would attach settlements so, so completely to Israel that Israelis wouldn't know which was which. And we walked out of there thinking this guy is delusional. We're at the height of the peace process. And I look at it now and I say, Penthouse Wallerstein played a much longer game and we allowed hope or a lot of us at least held on to hope and policymakers allowed hope or a desire to not clash with the Israelis to say, we're not gonna pay attention to that. Don't worry about that. That can all be undone. And it can be undone. But let's not pretend that even at the height of the Rabin era or the Barak era, we ever had a government that was willing to curb settlement activity. And if you go through this book, you know, people sometimes say, why is the left obsessed with settlements? I would argue the Israeli government is obsessed with settlements and we're observing that. And anyone who isn't looking at what's happening on the ground when we're dealing with a conflict that's supposed to be resolved, at least in theory, through land for peace, is really missing the point. Um, can, I, can I just add on this? I, I, you can't see it very well, but there's a maps that we had made for the book. Uh, on the left, you'll see this is 1977, before Camp David. You have about anywhere between 2,500 and 5,000 settlers and 42 settlements. In 1992, this is before Oslo, before the period that Lara's even talking about, you have 105,400 settlers and 139 settlements designed very explicitly under Sharon's idea of uh, settling the West Bank hinterlands, right, not just the Jordan Valley, but also places near Tokarim and Nablus, etc. Uh, making it very impossible for contiguous sovereignty. Meron Ben Benisti, the deputy mayor of Jerusalem, talked about the irreversibility thesis, that this can't be undone. You may argue differently, and Gershon Shafir and others have argued with Ben Benisti, but the map shows you very clearly, even before Oslo, look what's happening. And I would argue, and what I argue in the book, is there's a legal shift that also enables this expansion, and that's an American story. That's a story that has to do with what happens here in the United States, uh, in the Office of the Legal Advisor at the State Department, and in the, in the White House uh, uh, as well, about the legal definition uh, of settlements. And Begin says very clearly to Alexander Haig, uh, when Carter came here, he and I debated endlessly. I said the settlements are not illegal. He said, are not I I I illegal. He said they are illegal. They're obstacles to peace. I didn't tire. He didn't tire. And thankfully, here you are, Ronald Reagan, Alexander Haig. Settlements are not illegal. They're merely obstacles uh, to peace. Uh, the double negative makes it clear that they are legal and legitimate. I remember being in the day after Reagan said that at the press conference that settlements were legal, that the Israelis wouldn't do that. Uh, I went over to see Maury Draper and April Claspie, who both went, the president said it. And I said back to them, um, I said, even the Pope can't do that. He has to have, the, you know, to speak ex cathedra, he has to have the church, the cardinals as a whole endorse. Um, or, you know, he speaks on behalf of. But it happened like that. The language shifted overnight. And then we then went to the legal advisor to get 
the opinion that would validate what Reagan had just said. Um, and I, I mean, I think that I, I read it in a very troubled way because I'd, I'd had a falling out with Edward Said. It was a very painful one because we'd been close for decades. I mean, he was a mentor, a friend, and somebody who stood by me when many others wouldn't um, uh, over issues that evolved in the community. But we had a falling out over Oslo. We had a, a couple of article exchange, at which point I called it quits because I said, you know, he said, aren't you going to respond back? I said, no, Edward, because I've seen you maul people. I, <laughs> I, wanna, I don't want to go, I don't want our relationship to end this way. He laughed and it was over. Um, but um, I really did think it could work. And, and I fault the Clinton administration principally um, for it not working. Also, Congress and APEC, I mean, they, instead of doing away with the PLO ban, they encumbered the aid with a whole bunch of, of issues, which I think um, did real damage to the trust and the relationship. But because I was running a project with Vice President Gore called Builders for Peace in the West Bank, we were in regular communication both with him but also with, the, uh, with President Clinton on the problems we were encountering on the West Bank. And what would happen would be that the president would get upset and the memo would go back to Dennis or Martin, damn it, I want to know about this, and then they'd write back and then I'd get back the letter from correspondence with basically what Dennis and Martin would say, which is they gave, they, they gave short shrift to any of the concerns. They were focused, as you said, or as you said, on the peace process. We're in a process that'll take care of itself. The fact that the economy was worsening, that settlements were doubling, that unemployment was doubling, all of that stuff mattered not a bit after the closure that the West Bank was actually paralyzed. Um, mattered nothing to them because they were focused on the discussions and not on the conditions that were happening on the ground or that what it was doing to the will of the people to continue with that process. And, and um, I think a, a, a little more James Baker hmm. from the Clinton administration, if there had been somebody in that administration who'd had the, understood the nexus between politics and policy and used pressure more effectively, we might have had a different outcome. But basically, we got rolled. Maybe I just actually read an excerpt about this particular yeah. issue because I think it's relevant here. Um, this is from a meeting that was taking place in Washington here in the process of the Madrid talks. Uh, this is uh, in chapter eight. During a heated meeting at the State Department in which the Palestinians responded to the Israeli proposal on, uh, on a limited uh, uh, autonomy, Palestinian negotiator Hanan Ashrawi said the Israeli proposal was, quote, a reorganization of the occupation. Mm -hmm. It confirms the occupation and legitimizes the annexation of land. When asked by U.S. Ambassador Edward Jirian whether this really was the case, Ashrawi shot back, either they're playing games or they're not that serious about the transfer of authority to the Palestinians. This is totally unacceptable. The frustration was on full display. Ashrawi asked how long Palestinians could participate in a charade. Our credibility with our people is diminished. Things are worse on the ground. American officials took issue with the Palestinian portrayal of events. U.S. diplomat Daniel Kurtzer told Ashrawi she was, quote, posturing, and that as long as the Palestinians were in negotiations, quote, see what's there. They, Israel, won't put a position mm -hmm. on the table you like, just argue against it. Elias Samber, one of the Palestinian representatives, protested that the problem was that, quote, land is completely absent from their presentation. Kurtzer stated, so make it present. Work on a way you can effectively exercise authority over the land. Um, and this goes on, uh, and, and I'll just end with, the, with this part, um, where uh, uh, Hanan says uh, the following, or in the exchange with, with Kurtzer, Ashrawi articulated the core elements of her opposition to the Israeli proposal. Their position is racist. We start with the premise that we are human beings. Israelis only talk about Israeli interests and then say they can stay under conditions of coexistence under their own terms. Kurtzer urged the Palestinians to work on responding to the Israeli proposal despite the difficult odds. He recalled Faisal Husseini remarking, quote, there has never been a case with a people who have somehow mm -hmm. been able to negotiate their own way out of occupation. Yeah. Actually, and uh, I think just, just one thing, on the issue of, of Hanan's comment, one of the things that always has plagued me over these 40 years I've been doing this is the extent to which 
the United States policymakers pay attention to is internal Israeli debates. Well, the Israelis can't do that because you know, I mean, President Clinton knew the name of every goddamn Knesset member and how they'd vote on a different bill. No attention was paid to internal Palestinian democracy and therefore what could or couldn't be done. So the weakest party was always asked to do the heavy lifting because the strongest party was hampered by internal debate. And much of the deformations of, that have taken place in Palestinian politics are the result of the fact that we made their leaders do things that they shouldn't have done, um, which created these kind of repercussions in the, in the polity. I'm and we also, still don't see it. I'm also gonna stop and just very quickly read one paragraph that hit me very hard. And again, I reported, I was writing cables from 92 to 94 on settlements. This is from a cable from 1979. So I'm gonna read this. Many Palestinians look at the future through the experience of the past and see the possibility of these Jewish settlers slowly transforming the West Bank bit by bit mm -hmm. into Jewish controlled into Jewish controlled entity. First the Jerusalem suburbs, Jordan Valley, Etzion, Block and Kiryat Arba, then the other close in planned areas like Yivon, Maleo Dimim, Ofra. These residents envisioned, quote, a process of nibbling away at the remaining bedrock of Arab Palestine, splitting it with Israeli-built roads connecting Tel Aviv with the Jordan Valley, engulfing the area from Bethlehem to Ramallah and halfway to Jericho, and eventually ghettoizing the Arab population centers such as Nablus and Hebron. And it goes on. This may indeed be far-fetched fear, but such fears and paranoia, it's fears and paranoia, are rampant and affect the general mood of the West Bank. That is from a cable written from the US consulate in Jerusalem in 1979. Take that in. All right, so Phil Wilcox, I think, had the next question up here. And then we'll move up to Art Hughes in the front. Uh, thank you for your, yeah. your commentary. I'm anxious to read your book. Uh, I was the US consul general in Jerusalem from 88 to 91. Uh, I followed the legal issue very carefully. Uh, I have never seen or heard of a U.S. government document that rejected uh, the authoritative view of the legal advisors of the Department of State. Herbert Hansel. It, Herb Hansel. Uh, Reagan said, settlements are not, not illegal, he may have said, I believe. Uh, of course, that was a profoundly important policy statement, but I don't believe that any U.S. government lawyer, uh, by his own initiative or was, or by instruction, uh, altered the, that legal position of Herb Hansel, uh, which remains today, as far as I know. Of course, that's, o that's only a historic, uh, quaint historic uh, <laughs> footnote <laughs> these days. But do you know uh, that, uh, now of course, Eugene Rostow yes. uh, was quite open about it, but I don't believe that he wrote on the issue until after he was out of office. No, he wrote on it in office, and he this did. is talked about in the book, and I should add also, we have the memo of Raymond Tanter in the National Security Council in 1981, who said the following uh, in an official letter to Reagan, the settlements are legal, but the issue is properly a political question, not a legal question. The U.S. government has recognized no country's sovereignty over the West Bank since Britain controlled the area under the Palestine Mandate. The issue of sovereignty is open and will not be closed until the actual parties to the conflict formally consent to a peace agreement. In the meantime, there is no law that bars Jews from settling in the West Bank. No one should be excluded from an area simply on account of nationality or religion. An ambiguous response concerning the legality of settlements inadvertently causes more press interest than either one, a finding that settlements are legal, or two, a statement that the legal question is irrelevant. Mm. That was Tanter. Not right, so Thank you very much. Uh, a lot of discussion has been touching Art, on... Art, can you the, introduce yourself? Oh, my name is Art Hughes. Uh, I was a deputy ambassador in, in Tel Aviv for three years, and what happened to me quite frequently and happened in all times since the establishment of the State of Israel is 
that people in the embassy would go in, make their case, and then the Israelis would check, touch base in Washington and see what the political reality was. Now that leads me to my fundamental belief that U.S. policy on this issue is not driven by analysis of people who worked hard on the ground like Laura or other, others here in this room, but by the American political dynamic. Mm -hmm. Now, to what extent do you really talk about the American political dynamic? Because all this other stuff is great, and I'll buy the book and mm -hmm. read it too, for sure, yeah. uh, as, a, as a graduate in history from my university, and also a guy on the ground. But to what extent do you deal with that reality? Yes. Because this other stuff is all kind of interesting, but really not terribly relevant. Well, I, I do in the sense that there's part, several parts of the story that, that are obviously about the, the domestic political context. First is the rise of uh, a, a sort of a, a transformation in American policy away from detente towards the, 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 the rhetoric of human rights in the Carter administration. And this has serious import for the way in which the Middle East is dealt with. Um, and and, and I, I talk about uh, this new approach and new attitude towards uh, a human rights uh, foreign policy and the backlash against this. And this is where we can see and trace the rise of neoconservatives uh, who, who migrate from the Democratic Party uh, to, to, to Reagan Republicans. So there's the Cold War context. I also talk a lot about the domestic American Jewish political context. Remember, the American Jewish community had always been supportive of labor governments. They were familiar. They were extremely uh, supportive of the labor governments. In 1977, when Begin wins, there is a very clear, explicit decision made at the level of the Conference of Presidents of major Jewish organizations to shift their support towards the Likud. I argue and I explain in the book, this has long-lasting consequences. Uh, and so that's a domestic story of American Jewish political actors. There's also an Arab-American story to be told. I only briefly touch on this. I, I would absolutely uh, encourage you, if you're interested, to look at the work both of Salim Yaqub, who's uh, a leading historian, uh, who's written a wonderful book called Imperfect Strangers, but also Pamela Pennock, who's written about Arab-American activism. It's a very important story of domestic actors and how they influence and shape uh, these questions. And, and Jim could say a lot more about this uh, than I can. Just let me say that on the domestic political side, uh, what inhibited administrations from doing it. I, um, I found fascinating the memo exchanges between presidents and their domestic policy advisors, in particular in Carter. Uh, the Carter administration, y you can't do this, you can't say that, you got to be careful about this, it's creating problems, you got elections coming, et cetera. That, that, that runs through the book very clearly. Um, but what I also found interesting was the, the musings of Carter and of Reagan, which fascinated me that um, despite the fact that Reagan did what he did or said what he said and um, his advisors didn't have to write him so many memos because he was right on the page, um, in his private memos um, and memoirs, he is about as forceful in his feelings about Palestinians as Jimmy Carter ever was. Um, and that, that sort of intrigued me um, a great deal. It's like, that's the Reagan I would have wanted as president, not the one we actually had. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that um, while his focus is in Congress, and that would have been an added dimension to the book, it, just in terms of how Congress and or the various forces that move Congress play into the White House and into State Department in terms of internal memos that go back and forth, that's a central piece of the book and fascinating. And I thank you again for, for that kind of stuff. I think that really played out the internal dynamic a lot. I would also add one thing that I thought was interesting reading the book. Um, I was also either not born or too young for, for some of this. Um, the, the parallels reading the, the sections talking about the, the sort of popular um, unhappiness in the American Jewish community, the neoconservatives with Carter and, and really treating Carter as an enemy. Mm -hmm. And then Reagan coming in as the guy who's gonna reset and fix the relationship. When in fact, under Carter, Israel got really everything it wanted. Um, it got a peace process with Egypt, which achieved exactly what it wanted with the Palestinians, and it got to do it while still playing sort of this victim. 
it sounded so familiar having lived yeah. through <laughs> Obama into this exactly. era. Um, exactly. The demonization of any U.S. party that is seen by the Israelis to, to feel any sympathy or to humanize the Palestinians, it isn't even really about the policy at some point. Whatever policy you take, if someone is seen to be sympathetic to the Palestinians, then that becomes something that has to be sort of beaten down. And the um, rhetorical excess, which is something that we've all lived through, um, the language about the PLO, the savages, animals. Nazis, over and Nazis, over, Nazis. Um, so, there was, as I remember playing out in that period, my PhD was in religion. It almost felt like a primitive religion taboo. You know, Jesse Jackson, he, 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 he made, had contact with, he touched Yasser Arafat. The act of touching or of having Arafat touch you made you somehow unclean. Andy and, Young. Yeah, Andy Young. Um, yeah. And, Hillary because, Clinton shaking Suha Arafat's hand. Um, yeah, uh, the, um, the this becoming unclean and taboo was something they used very effectively to parallel their refusal to accept sovereignty and and, and the right of a people. Um, if you talk to the PLO, their concern was you would recognize self determination de facto, but the way that they stopped you from doing it was simply making it unclean to have any contact. Yeah. I, I might just add there that the irony is that at the same time there's a, a whole host of secret conversations and negotiations, Nick you would know about this, that are happening both in the Carter and in the Reagan administration with the PLO. Yeah. So while the outward story is one of contamination or uh, exclusion, it, both in the context of the Lebanese Civil War but also more strategically uh, and you can read this uh, in The Good Spy, a wonderful book by Kai Bird, uh, uh, recently published, uh, there was extensive negotiations mm -hmm. that were being uh, done uh, both via Walid Khalidi, a Palestinian scholar uh, who, who, who is in, in Boston, but also um, by a prominent uh, Quaker uh, political figure who was very involved in, in these talks, and I write about that. I should say one word, though, about the evolution of the PLO itself, because I think it's important to say something about this. You know, the PLO, by the time that Carter takes office, has shifted very clearly away from armed struggle towards diplomatic engagement. The legacy of that armed struggle and of the violent actions of the late 60s and the early 70s clearly weighed very heavily, in particular in the American Jewish community and also on Cold War conservatives. And that's part of the reason why you had such a vociferous uh, rhetorical attitude. But it was clear by the time that you get UN recognition and in the fact that the United uh, Nations and, and European powers have already started recognizing and officially uh, engaging with the PLO that there had been a transformation. And we can see this uh, uh, well documented in the work of Yazid Sayer, in the work of Mohammed Muslih, and others who have talked about this transformation. Um, and, and it's because that, that, that transformation is somewhat slow at stages in the 70s, and there's a resistance to endorse UN Resolution 242 for the very reason that that resolution does not guarantee Palestinian sovereignty or statehood. That uh, the fiction or the hostility towards the PLO as uh, an incompatible partner persists. In 1988, I was the Jackson person negotiating with Wendy Sherman and Madeleine Albright and others uh, from the Dukakis team on the Democratic Party platform. Uh, the party platform had always, because it was Carter, always mentioned Camp David. Um, and. What, it, wouldn't, it would have caused an uproar with some of our, our folks in the Jackson campaign, but we were willing at one point in the negotiations to settle for using the t s phrase, fulfilling the terms of Camp David, comma, including the legitimate rights of the Palestinian people. That's, that would have done it for us, just, just to get Palestinians in the platform. So What I heard back from them was, if the P word is even in the platform, we'll lose in November. That They called it the P word. Um, and so it, the issue of not just not talking to the PLO, not recognizing sovereignty, but you couldn't even use the P word. So I want to bring us back for a second to where we are today and make this point again. The PLO mission was shut down. The ambassador has mm -hmm. been ejected. The visa's canceled for him and his family. 
when the U.S. did not issue the waiver that allowed the PLO mission to remain open all these mm -hmm. years, the law is mm -hmm. now back in application that effectively makes it illegal for the PLO to operate at all in this country. They can't disseminate anything. They can't. They, you can go through. There's, there's legislation on the books since right. 1987. That's back in force. As we, everyone's focused on the mission. Pay attention to the fact that under U.S. law, it is back with full force of U.S. law that the PLO is a terrorist organization, even if it's not on right. the U.S. designated list. That's number one. Number two, Taylor Force Act, I'm going to mention it again. The findings of that legislation passed with bipartisan majorities, House and Senate, there is no way to read those findings and not take away that it is U.S. settled law that as long as the PLO or the PA give any money to families of people who are in Israeli jails or survivors of people who are killed by Israel, that the PA and the PLO support terror. That is where we are getting to today. That's why I want to say, if you want to see where the policy goes now, look back to pre-Madrid. We are returning to a place where it is going to be increasingly difficult, if not illegal, to engage with Palestinian leadership. And that isn't a matter of paranoid, you know, what does it say in here? That's, you know, maybe paranoia. This is where we're going today in mm -hmm. law. And, and folks who don't pay attention to what it looked like before and where we're going now are going to be really surprised when we get there, and there's not going to be anything they can do about it. Um, we're going to Howard Sumka next. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Howard Sumka. I was the USA director in West Bank, Gaza for four years. Um, although I'm old enough to remember having seen the robe as an eight or nine year old kid and having come away with it, from it with images that I still can conjure in my mind because I was totally blown away by how ugly that movie was. Uh, but I wasn't involved in, in all the pre-Oslo stuff. I didn't come to this issue until a little over a decade ago. Um, and that was in 2006 when just before Salam Fayyad came in, and then he came in. And what, what I'd like to do, if we could, is just bring the discussion forward out of the sort of longer historical context and, and ask you how you reacted in that period of 2000, or how you would react to that period in, in 2007 till about 2014, when it was the very explicit policy of the US government to help the Palestinians build the Palestinian state. At least it was the articulated policy. And even it got to the point that Bibi Netanyahu said Palestinian state in his Bar Ilan speech or some version of that, even though I don't think anybody believed he really meant it. And now he's confirmed that he never really meant it. But we were spending $400 million a year on assistance that was, among other things, intended to help the Palestinian Authority evolve, evolve into something that would be a sovereign government. Salam Fayyad, Fayyad had all the backing of the West. In 2009, he put forward his vision for a Palestinian state. He updated it in 2011. He presented it to the Ad Hoc Liaison Committee at the General Assembly, at the uh, fringes of the General Assembly every September. And yet, at the core, the U.S. is coming at this from a position of not supporting the Palestinian state, of, of decades of history of not supporting it. And I have to say, having coming into it a little bit on the late side, was quite naive in how I approached what I was trying to do and how I understood what, what, what the agenda was. Uh, and it, it needs to be said that Fayyad also didn't have the support of the Palestinian Authority or the, or, or the, the PLO. Um, I mean, he once said to me, you know, you all think my problem is Hamas. It's not Hamas, it's Fatah. Uh, and so this whole notion of statehood kind of emerged in, in, in a very uh, vibrant, visible way for a very short period and now seems to have slipped back 30 years into, into old history. And I just appreciate your reaction to that. Well, it fits with this idea that there could have been and there are windows where possible sovereignty is being pursued. It's not to say that those were always closed down. But the problem with that particular example is that they weren't connected to a final political outcome that was designed necessarily to lead to statehood. And this is where you can talk about the return of this idea of economic peace that we hear by Kushner and Greenblatt, etc. What does economic peace mean if it's not connected to a political outcome? If you cannot preserve the claim of self-determination and sovereignty for Palestinians, assistance on the ground, building nice schools and shiny roads is not actually going to lead to a sustainable end result. 
And I think that was, in some ways, the sad legacy of what happened with Fayyad, is that there was all of this investment and all this work, and there was no connection with a political program and a sovereign outcome. So we have about 15 minutes left. We're going to take a few questions at once. We're going to start here. I believe you had a question. No? So yes? Yes. So we need a micro microphone over here on the side. The side. Yes. And then over here in the middle. So we'll start Before here. Before you introduce yourself, Joe Saba um, was at the World Bank. And I remember when I started with Builders for Peace, the required reading for anybody was his eight-volume study on the economy of, uh, of the occupied territories. It was, it was hopeful, it was brilliant, <laughs> but it's been completely ripped apart since then. Not the, the study, but the realities on the ground have been transformed. Yeah, I, thanks. Um, I did the legal work on that and wrote the background papers between 92 and 93. Then I lived the four years in Jerusalem, 97 to 2001. Right and is continuing until 2010 as director for the Middle East programs at the World Bank. And I've been chairman of an era and I'm still a board member. So I've, it's been a 25 year plus uh, endeavor. But I wanted to thank you first for the book. Uh, when we did that volume study, we went back to the late 70s and the Begin period to look at how the allocation of land, water, movement would, was planned and how that was, what was happening from that late, late, that Begin period until we were writing our period, our piece. The piece that did not get into that several volume book, which I still have, was a long piece which detailed in great length the legal basis on, and, and the maps and other material that we got largely at that time from some friends at the Israeli Supreme Court and others as to what is it they actually intended in the West Bank in Gaza following, it gets technical, but following the 1967 Jordanian land registration and other measures which were then incomplete. The plan was very clear. When, by when we came out with that draft volume, the United States, which is of course, a major shareholder at the bank said, this was embarrassing and not critical. And there was a famous evening where I was told to stay out of the West Bank in Gaza. Um, that got overruled after a time, but it was difficult. And much of what we wrote never appeared. Following that, in 1997, in my first meeting with Netanyahu, um, with Jim Wolfenson, it was his first meeting, we sat and Netanyahu, and I have my notes, made it very clear that statehood, because I raised it and kind yeah. of got everybody upset, because I was naive too, because um, I thought we were going forward. That's, and, and it was very clear during those four years that that is not where we were going. Take a look at what happened in the municipal elections. But I did want, again, I wanted to come back and thank you for that, because that blueprint was, was and remains there and it's been a long project which has been very successfully implemented. But what I wanted to ask you, having, sorry for a long comment, what I did want to ask you is the other side of this, because in writing this material and having long discussions with Faisal Husseini, and just last night with Mohammed Shtaya and, and other friends, it was clear to me, it was my impression in those days that the PLO people, particularly those coming out of Tunis, and I used to meet at least bi-weekly with Arafat on many issues, had little or no understanding of the technical points I was trying to make. That is, we knew what was happening with the settlement documents and the, yeah. we knew what happened with your reports. We were trying to make the economic case that this is not going to work. Huh? But when we also tried to make the technical points and insert those into the arguments with, on the Palestinian side, we did not, we didn't, I didn't sense from my mm. perch much understanding of what we were trying to get because they too seemed to rely entirely on the political position yeah. and thought mm -hmm. maybe the Americans yes. somehow would carry the water for them. Did you encounter that in your research? Because I, I had not seen much material on that when I did my research. Well, the, 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 the oh. Hold your answer, just take a note, and we're gonna come to the middle right now, we're taking 
this question we have one over here, one over here, and that's it. So this one here, and then over here, and then we're done. Well, hi there. Thank we're you very much. We're a little over time. If people need to leave, that's fine. Thank you very much. My name is Ken Audrey. I'm a former Foreign Service officer, served in Israel, as well as many of its neighbors. And uh, I do recall knowing at the time that the, I met a number of good Israelis, none of them in the government today. But I wanted to ask you what, to, to sort of reverse things and ask, well, what is your forecast for the future? What can we expect? What can we work for? depending on our orientations. Is it a one-state one solution? Is it something else? I'd be interested to hear your predictions and anything that Americans can do. I haven't heard much from J Street recently. I don't know. They seem to be pretty quiet. Anyway, thank you. All right, so we have two questions to close it up. Why don't we let you go last so you can Perfect. finish it? So I'm going to go first because I'm here, and I'm just going to take on that last point. Um, in, in terms of where things go, and, you know, the, I've already said, I think if you want to know where things are going, look at where we've been. We're, we're headed back, legally at least, to pre-Madrid, where there are not kosher Palestinian political interlocutors. We're already headed that way. Uh, for folks who pay attention to this sort of thing, look very, very carefully at the legal um, and bureaucratic attacks against the NGO sector. In Europe right now, there is a, a campaign to make it impossible for most Palestinian NGOs to operate or raise funds based on the argument that they are one, two, three, four, five degrees removed from the PFLP. Um, even though no one's actually, PFLP is basically moribund, these people haven't been active, and that's gonna come here. Um, we are gradually moving back very clearly to a place where the U.S. looks to other Arab states to speak for the Palestinians. And I believe we're coming with the, with the tax on UNRWA. We're coming to a point where the international community is going to hear from the U.S. If you want us to put money up, then you have to drop all the political stuff. If you value politics more than you value human lives, then my God, why do you hate the Palestinians so much? I think that's the direction this moves. Um, and in terms of what can be done to, to push back, we're at a very difficult moment because really all that's left is, is international law, is international norms, international consensus, and all of those are under much broader attack right now. It's almost a perfect storm. Um, that doesn't mean that international law, international consensus, international norms don't matter. But at this point, when we get asked, most of us, in, I think in the analytical class, are asked about one state, two state, the answer is, what does that question even mean? I personally believe this only ends in two states. But two states isn't on the agenda right now. The Israeli government doesn't support two states. The Trump administration doesn't support two states. And yet I still hear progressive candidates having it demanded of them to express fealty to two states. Are your Palestinians being asked this as if it's, you know, if you want your kosher card, yeah. you have to say it. It's surreal. It really is surreal. Um, we are, as, as, the interne as the United States, we are pushing the Palestinians to where they only have, they only have violence. We are saying you don't have a diplomatic process, you cannot engage in boycotts, you cannot divest, all of those things are anti-Semitic, and we are going to outlaw them. We're in the process in the US of outlawing them if we can. And at that point, we say, okay, well, it's violence and nobody likes violence, therefore you're terrorists. I, I don't know where the energy to push back comes from, but honestly, if progressives can't stand up against the two-state, one-state, um, fake binary, and if progressives can't stand up for free speech, even if they personally don't support this kind of free speech, um, then I, I don't know where that I, I don't know where that energy will come from in the United States. Mm -hmm. And I will leave it with those happy, happy words and turn it over to my colleagues. One, if we're looking forward and looking backward in order to look forward, one issue in the book uh, that comes through, um, you make note at one point of the the absence of Arab Americans. And I just want to, first time I was invited to the White House was 1978 to a, um, a meeting with Walter Mondale of ethnic leaders here in Washington. Um, three days later, the person at public liaison at the White House called me to say, I'm so sorry, but we can't have you back again uh, because we got lots of calls from 
major Jewish organizations saying we had a pro-Palestinian uh, Arab in the room, and they don't want they don't want that to happen again. Um, if you, my office is collecting now, going back through my archives of, of pain, <laughs> um, of, of the books by the ADL, the AJC, uh, and APEC, uh, edited by Martin Indyk, incidentally, on who's who in Arab propaganda. It, th those books weren't just done to sort of collect them. Um, I was frequently um, disinvited from speaking engagements or had jobs that I'd had threatened um, and had my life threatened using the rhetoric that was in those sections. And that's only me. Um, we were maybe the only ethnic community um, operating here that had another ethnic community simply not wanting us to exist at all. And as the, um, the ADL wrote about it, they'd say there's no such thing as Arab Americans. It's a petrodollar fiction. Mm of Muslims and Christians who just happened to be of Syrian, Lebanese, mm. Palestinian, Egyptian, Iraqi descent. They didn't, it wasn't the PLO only that didn't exist. We didn't exist as a community. And when I was invited by an Italian American to head an ethnic council that dealt with media stereotyping, something we knew something about, uh, ADL said, we won't come, nor will any of us come. When we were invited in 1983 to the March on Washington to participate in the steering committee, Jewish organizations got together and said, if Jim Aberisk is on the National Steering Committee and if Jim Zogby is involved in the Planning Council, no Jews will participate, make a choice. And so we actually had to mobilize. We won because we had allies in that group that fought for us to do it. But, but the process of excluding us was so intense that it took a real toll on our ability to function here. And when I'm now looking forward, as I'm looking at Ken Marcus at Department of Education and seeing what is being done with the Canary Mission and others like that, um, we can exist as a social entity. I mean, I can do an Arab American hafle and invite people to come and eat gibbi and other good Israeli foods and stuff like that. <laughs> I like to say they got the land and the food too. Um, but uh, we can do that. But if we become political, then our very existence is threatening and therefore we become threatened. So that we can't, if, if, if I want to criticize, if I want to say Israel is a racist state, I'm an anti-Semite and I can't get a government contract for that. And, and, and we're seeing that play out in a very problematic way. So in some ways, we've also gone back to the 70s uh, in terms of the very way that Arab Americans who want to become active on this issue um, become, I think, uh, an endangered species, yeah. and that's, that's very problematic. I, I just want to say, I mean, this was shameful behavior on behalf of American Jewish organizations who should have known better given the history of the ADL and of the AJC as constituent in building the post-war liberal American state because they were, um, historians who have worked on these organizations were fighting for civil rights, for equality, they were teaming up with African Americans, the raison d'etre of these organizations was to fight for those very values, mm -hmm. which they then go on to deny in the service of a right-wing alignment with uh, a variety or version of Israeli foreign policy, uh, which we, we can see where, where that ended up. And of course, we see echoes of this returning now. We don't have to look very far beyond the people who were involved uh, in giving invocation and benediction speeches at the opening of the embassy in Jerusalem. And if you read what they say about Jews in their text, it would make your skin crawl. That com common cause is a, a kind of shameful alignment. I, I live in London, I, I don't live here, but I see that creeping as well into the UK. With the and, Labour Party debate. Yeah, yeah. but also with the, the way in which uh, activism on these issues becomes criminalized or politicized. Mm -hmm. um, but to go back to, to these questions, um, I'll say two things. One on the first question uh, of uh, a kind of uh, a possibility uh, of what the Palestinians did or did not know in the late 90s. Uh, yesterday I presented the book with my PhD advisor, uh, Rashid Khalidi, who was uh, an advisor to the Palestinian delegation in Washington. And this was the point that he took up very clearly in his critique of Oslo, because this was the basis of why there was such anger and frustration by those experts in uh, the Washington talks uh, with Arafat's 
uh, insistence on doing these secret negotiations and returning to the West Bank and Gaza over the advice of all these advisors who were exactly as you're suggesting aware of all those complexities, aware of the political nuance, aware of the legal ramifications, doing their own research. That Palestinian uh, advisory group in Madrid was given the papers of the Egyptian delegation to the autonomy talks as a warning of what not to let happen in the event of this suggestion of a revival of the idea of autonomy. So they were very well prepared for those issues. What comes afterwards is a great disappointment in the wider landscape of Palestinian political history. And I think you're right on that score. Uh, and then I'll just end with this last question of what is my forecast for the future? And, and I'm supposed to, as a historian, always pull out the card that I'm <laughs> not, not telling the future. I'm trying to describe the past. Um, but I will echo something that Lara said. First is that I think the one state, two state debate is a red herring. We should not be talking about what the outcome looks like. We should be talking about certain principles. And what does equality, what does justice, what does sovereignty mean? How do you preserve sovereignty and self-determination for Palestinians? So I think it's about reframing the way we talk uh, about that. Um, and in that sense, my fear is where we're headed is where the book ends, which is where Naftali Bennett is going. And that has to do with annexation of Area C. It has to do uh, with this uh, reintroduction of the idea of autonomy. Um, and it has to do, uh, as, uh, as, as Bennett says um, in, in recently in, in an interview, that Palestinians, quote, will govern themselves in all aspects barring two elements, overall security responsibility and not being able to allow the return of descendants of Palestinian refugees. And as I say, this is the echo of Menachem Begin. And I think that, that where we're at now is the American administration is endorsing that view. And that's where I think we're headed. Um, but I, I certainly would, would say that the, the one state, two state paradigm is, is not a good way of thinking about the future. And with that, we're gonna close it up. Thank you all so much for attending. Thanks MEI for these beautiful facilities and co-hosting. And we have future events coming up. Please check our website, www.fmep.org. And you can buy this wonderful book out in the lobby. I encourage you to read it. <laughs>